whoever becomes the leader in AI will be the ruler of the world. I didn't say that. Vladimir Putin did, all the way back in 2017. If you look throughout history, the greatest civilizations have always been tied to technology. And sovereignty has always been tied to technology, as has power. So the greatest risk of our time isn't, in my view, inflation, market instability, or even war in the conventional sense. It's that we, democracies, fail to reimagine what a technological republic looks like, and we fail to utilize AI and advanced technologies as a geopolitical advantage. The exponential technology of our age is computing, right? And for the past six decades, computing power has been driven, the progress has been exponential, driven by so-called Moore's Law. Everyone who's heard of Moore's Law? Yes. So this was um, the power law observed by the co-founder of Intel, Gordon Moore, in the 60s, where he said that every two years, the number of transistors in a computer chip would double. So essentially all that means is that computing power has become ubiquitous. It's been on an exponential growth trajectory and it's underpinned now every aspect of our modern society, right? From PCs, to the mobile phone, to the internet, to how we run our economy, how we communicate. Every fundamental facet of life is underpinned by the power of computing and silicon, i.e. these computing chips. But now we're entering into something that is far more interesting in my view, because we're not just talking about scaling the power of computing, so not just computing hardware, but we are actually trying to scale intelligence itself through computing. What does that look like? Well, AI scaling laws are what is behind this phenomenal progress in AI. The more data, computing powers and parameters, in this case, architectural complexity you feed into AI models, the more capable or intelligent they become. And the really fascinating thing is that this is happening at a rate that is far faster than Moore's law, you know, that was doubling every two years. This is happening at a pace of every six months. Capability is increasing very, very quickly. And at the same time, this is of course powered by Moore's law and hardware, but again, like I say, we're, we're not just trying to exponentially increase the power of hardware, we're trying to scale intelligence. And at the same time, cost is collapsing. So what happens if, thanks to computing power and this increased architecture and the fact that you have so much capital expenditure going into this area, you take intelligence and you convert it from something which has always been non-scalable, something that has always been locked in individual human minds, right? Something that was a very uh, rare resource and you convert it into something that's cheap, ubiquitous, and abundant, powered by computers. Well, that's when intelligence becomes a utility. So I think that's what's happening now. I call it industrializing intelligence, where we are transitioning from a world that has historically always been the case, where, AI, where intelligence is non-scalable, rare, finite, is becoming something that is a utility that is integrated into every part of the economy and society. So if you have industrial intelligence as a utility, what does it do to national sovereignty? And the answer is, it rewrites the rules of power and national sovereignty from the ground up, touching the most important aspects, economic prosperity, security, and the future of innovation through science and technology. Everything is going to be downstream of being able to control and capitalize industrial intelligence. So this is how it fundamentally changes the world order. And I think that there's only two countries in the world that truly understand this. 
China and the United States. China understood it first, actually, because in 2019, no, 2017, just when Putin said whoever controls AI is going to rule the world, they actually established through national, became a national policy, the next gen AI next generation development plan, that they would become the global leaders in AI by 2030. And by 2019, they also had a policy position, a paper, into how they would intelligentize, right? Think of intelligence as a utility, the PLA, the People's Liberation Army. And for those of us who are China watchers, that was on display at a military parade just last month in Tiananmen Square. The US, though leading in innovation, private sector innovation over the past few years, in particular when it comes to AI, this wasn't any kind of official or national strategy or policy. That changed this year with the current administration through a series of executive orders and also the US AI action plan where the administration has made it fundamentally clear that technology dominance and technology superiority is the way by which Washington sees uh, the future of the US's power globally and also the basis of the future of its economic prosperity to be. So we're in this race to become an AI superpower. It's going to change the balance uh, of geopolitics in this century. I think it's the most interesting geopolitical story of the 21st century. But what does that actually take? Right? It's all well and good to say we're going to be an AI superpower. Many countries in Europe say that too. But what does it actually take? And to understand that, I talk about this pyramid which leads to the apex, right? And the fundamental thing that you need in terms of achieving this is that you need the base layer, the foundation, which is an industrial and resource base, right? You need to have cheap and abundant energy. You need to have access to raw minerals. You need to be able to actually build things. You need to have advanced manufacturing capability. This foundational part is what we in the West have kind of offshored in the pursuit of globalization over the past few decades. And now we're finding that we are at a very big strategic disadvantage. Only when you have this foundation can you get to the next level, which is almost like the engine of industrial intelligence. Here, I'm talking about the computational need, right? The chips. The data centers, I talk about data centers, but actually if you look at the infrastructure that's being built right now, it's an entirely new beast. It's uh, more like the AI factories of the future and the cloud computing, everything, that core infrastructure that's both physical and exists in the cloud to run intelligence at scale, right? This is the engine. Then only you get to the part where you build the models and the applications, and only when you have all three of these working in tandem, um, a concert, can you really get to the apex where you have the kind of transformative AI integration and strategic autonomy across defense and across the economy. Now to support this at every level, you need to have the talent, you need to have the capital, and you need to have the right environment when it comes to regulation. Now, if you look at this pyramid and you consider what I said about both the China and the U.S., you can see where the U.S. is strong, right? You kind of lead on the applications and the models and on at least the, the hardware design, the chips, right? There's a reason why NVIDIA is almost a $4 trillion company, but we are extremely weak on the foundation. And that is where China is very strong. And even on the intelligence and the application model now, uh, people tend to think that the US is far ahead, but that is not necessarily the case. I wanna give you an example of how weak we are in the base. So I talked about how critical it is to have access to raw minerals and resources, right? Rare earths and minerals are absolutely fundamental to everything in, in modern life, you know, whether it's the battery in your car or the battery in the fridge or the chips that NVIDIA makes, you need to have access to these raw 
resources. Well, China has a 70% monopoly over the world's uh, rare earths, and 90% of it is actually processed in China. So this shows us how, in the name of globalization, by kind of hollowing out our industrial base, we have a very critical vulnerability when it comes to the industry that matter in the future. It cannot be that in the next 10 years, if we kind of stay on the path that we're on, everything that matters will depend on whether or not uh, a strategic rival will allow us to have it. So now I think there are several critical unlockers in this race, and it is a race where you can get asymmetric advantage. And this is really fundamentally going to change the economy, and it's going to have a huge policy impact as well. You know, where are the areas where we can get asymmetric advantage? One of them is energy. Every kind of uh, idea we had about how much energy was required, uh, the projections that we used to have are, are fundamentally wrong because they didn't take into account the amount of energy that is required to achieve industrial intelligence, right? To have this huge transformative effect of AI across industry and society. That's why you start to see this new body of AI infrastructure being built right now here in the United States. Stargate is the $500, $500 billion AI data centers, I should say AI factories that are being developed right now. Uh, many of the sites are in Texas, where I live, by OpenAI and Oracle. We're talking about the energy requirements here on two of these sites to be operational within the next few years of seven gigawatts of power. That is more than several nuclear reactors. Right? That is more than entire small countries like Singapore. So we fundamentally need to rethink energy requirements going into this age of industrial intelligence. And that's why you start to see now, it's very exciting in the US how lots of VC money is also starting to flow into spaces like nuclear um, and small modular reactors. Again, looking at it from a global perspective, however, which country has been building an industrial baseload when it comes to energy capability? Well, China is far, far ahead. So this is the rough energy capacity for this year, 2025. China almost at 4,000 gigawatts, the US at 1,300. EU even further behind. And if you look at some of how Certain countries in Europe, you know, kind of the decisions that they've made on energy policy, they are strategically so disadvantaged because they do not have energy sovereignty. So if you talk about becoming an AI superpower and rebuilding and re reinvigorating uh, the sovereignty and economic prosperity of your country, energy is going to be the first unlocker. Second one, chips. So we talked about how silicon, already with Moore's law and now with AI scaling laws and the kind of hardware that's required to, develop, to deliver industrial intelligence, everything runs on chips, right? I already mentioned how NVIDIA is almost a $4 trillion company thanks to its amazing chip design. But here's the key. It makes the design. It doesn't actually manufacture the chips. Chip manufacturing... <laughs> is centralized in one island 100 miles off the coast of mainland China, Taiwan, right? And one company in particular, TSMC, produces over 90% of the world's most advanced chips. Remember, these chips are integral to everything from defense to just making sure that your car runs when you get in it. So this is an absolutely critical choke point. That's the reason why you see now hundreds of billions of dollars being invested into the US to build these fabs in the United States. And it's the reason why successive US administrations have banned the exports of the most advanced American silicone to China. And it's actually also the reason why, where just two weeks ago, the CCP has banned uh, the purchase of American chips for Chinese companies because they want chip 
sovereignty, right? They have a very strong industrial base, very strong manufacturing base. This is critical for them, that, the compute piece around chips. So this is the second place where we can get asymmetric advantage. And the final place has to do with talent. It has to do with mission and purpose. So already though, we're in this seismic moment of great, you can feel the weight of history upon us, right? You can feel how technology is changing the world at an exponential rate and changing seismic things like the world order. And yet, even a single person can have an impact at this moment. That's why you see so much competition for the elite talent, right? The elite AI engineers who are being offered hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of pay packages. But you also need lots of builders, right? I talked about the industrial nature of this. I talk about industrial intelligence. We need lots of mechanics. We need lots of engineers. We need lots of electricians. And it's, I know a lot of the debate around AI is about how it's automating jobs, but actually you can't get enough of these people, right? Where is this talent? Where are the people who are gonna deliver this industrial intelligence? And finally to end, perhaps uh, we could end on a more philosophical note, this theme of the conference is being human. I don't think we can talk about what it means to be human without considering the impact of exponential technologies on our society and our civilization. And it, we should ask ourselves, what is our mission with these extremely powerful technologies? Because it can't just be that we build trivial consumer apps and five AI friends for everyone. That is, that is Mark Zuckerberg's vision. We need to harness these technologies for a new sense of an Apollo mission, right? How do we use this to revitalize not only our security, but also our economic prosperity? And that starts with the belief in building and innovation uh, through science and technology. So it is our opportunity to seize or lose, and I sure hope we seize it. Thank you very much.